Okay, uh, let's start the uh, KGRI lecture series. Is uh, KGRI stands for KO Global Research Institute. Uh, this lecture series we started just about a year ago, and uh, actually Professor Carlin is the first KGRI lecture series uh, lecturer. Okay. And uh, uh, yeah, uh, he's back. Mm. And, uh, <coughs> It's my uh, great honor and pleasure to introduce uh, Professor Paul Oren, Karolinska Institute. Uh, Paul and I actually uh, the same PhD mentor, uh, Professor Anita Perrier. Uh, unfortunately, we didn't overlap, but to his man, uh, we uh, get in touch and uh, <coughs> we visit each other more than 10 times, yeah. training or something. And uh, he's uh, now a guest professor at Cambridge University, and uh, he has already published a uh, couple of papers uh, collaborating with uh, some researchers at KO. And we also sent the postdoc or students to Paris Lab, and they also did a great job. And today, uh, he's going to focus on, he has uh, two main projects, uh, one in the neuroscience and uh, the other one in the cancer biology. And he is also the expert. Uh, actually, he graduated from the uh, Royal Institute, Institute of Technology. Uh, then he uh, moved to the Karolinska and got his PhD there. So he's a biophysicist. He has a very strong background in biophysics and uh, <coughs> has been established a new method for the, uh, especially the imaging, right imaging, etc. So today, he's going to talk about the cancer biology, of course, the, from the aspect of the new uh, development of the microscope imaging system, right? Mm -hmm. <laughs> and the title of his talk is uh, Volumetric Metric Imaging of the Whole Tumors Reveals Cancer Malignancy. So please uh, start your presentation. Okay. Yeah, first of all, thank you very much for having me here at KU University. It's a great pleasure to be here. I see a lot of familiar faces there. That makes me feel very welcome. Thank you. Yes, so today I will talk about uh, uh, one of the projects that we have in the lab regarding uh, cancer. We have established a new method in, 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 in Karolinska and in our lab, which uh, deals with uh, light sheet microscopy. And, um, we had a, 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 a postdoc from Japan, Dr. Tomoyuki Tanaka, sitting here actually, who came to my lab, I think it was three years ago or something, three, four years ago, three years ago. And he was uh, very productive and, and, and we have published uh, quite many papers actually. And, and uh, I will tell you a little bit about those and also about uh, a future paper that we are writing and submitting now these days actually. I wrote on, it on, on the flight here to Japan. Okay, so um, here is the agenda for today's presentation. I will uh, tell you a little bit, uh, uh, give you a brief background on the methodologies that we are, that are like central for these projects that uh, I will present here today. And then I will tell you about mainly two different uh, methods that we have uh, developed uh, in, in the lab, uh, and one that we named DIPCO, uh, that uh, is, is uh, using this um, volumetric imaging, 3D imaging, to visualize uh, tumor samples. Uh, and then I will give you some uh, examples of how that can be applied uh, in, in, in the clinic or for medical purposes. And uh, then I will also tell you a little bit about the, uh, the next generation of this protocol that we are working on at this moment, which uh, is, is about RNA staining and in situ hybridization that we are doing together with immunolabeling. And I will also give you some proof of the principle there. But uh, first then to tell you about uh, some of the essential technologies that we are using. And one is this tissue clearing. And tissue clearing, I, uh, I guess that some of you already know about this, but it was, uh, it had had a kind of a, what uh, one could call it almost a revolution these latest years, like five, ten years ago. And it's about making tissues transparent to light. 
But this development was actually uh, first uh, published in 1914. It's almost, yeah, it's more than 100 years old, actually, this technology. And um, it was a guy that from Germany who was, was called Werner Spaltholz. And he, he, for the first time, made tissue transparent to light. And um, of course, that is uh, kind of a dream for a, a person working with microscopy, because then you can see through a tissue. And here is an example of, of a mouse brain, you see. Uh, and after it has been cleared with this uh, clearing technique. And then you see that you can see through it. And what you are doing, basically, is that you are, you are removing the lipids from, from, from the tissue. And then, after doing that, you, you have to uh, um, change the refractive index of the, the tissue so it matches the media that you have between the objective and the, 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 uh, the, the specimen that you are imaging. <clears throat> and it has it, it actually constantly many, many po protocols are developed uh, that optimize and aim to, to uh, visualize different tissues and different techniques and so on. And here is just a brief table. This is not all, all of the protocols, but they are specialized in different things. And you see that if you t look here, this was the first uh, paper by Spaltholz in 1914. And uh, you see that, uh, uh, and, and th there, this is another one called Bob, and then you have three disc and I disc and TDE and scale and cubic and clarity, and there are constantly developing protocols about this, and they are specialized on different things, depending if, if you are working maybe with transgenic animals, you are looking maybe at brain development, then you could have GFP expression in certain regions in the brain. And then you want to preserve the GFP fluorescence. And maybe you don't also want to alter the shape of the tissue. That could be, of course, uh, uh, very harmful. Or, for, uh, or it could be destroy the experiment if you are looking at certain regions that needs to be um, stay in the same shape as before. And you see, here is, uh, I just noted some of these features of the of the different protocols, and you see that some of them are optimized for for immunostaining, and some are not optimized for immunostaining, and some have sh shrinkage of the uh, tissue, and some have expansion, and yeah, yeah, there are many different things, and also the time, how long time it takes. You know, some of these protocols takes like month to run through the whole procedure. Uh, so, but uh, the, the, there will be many, many more protocols coming, I think, uh, the, the, the next couple of years. And also the other technology that we are applying here is this light sheet microscopy. And um, for those of you who are not familiar with the light sheet microscopy, I will just tell you a little bit briefly. So here is a cartoon showing uh, the basic principles with light sheet microscopy. You have an objective, and then you have an, an excitation light coming perpendicular to the objective, 90 degrees from the side. And then the, the, the laser beam usually goes through a, a lattice or, or a prism or something, and that splits it up to make like a sheet of light like this. So the sheet goes through uh, in front of the of the objective, and there you put your your sample that you are going to examine, and that you have made clear then with this clear, clearing protocol. And doing so, here's a picture showing like a cylinder where you have maybe a zebra fish or a drosophila or something small or a piece of tissue, and then you have the light coming from the side, and then you can look have the uh, CCD camera hooked up on the back of this objective, and then you get a, a, an entire picture of the sample at once. So it's a very fast way of, of scanning through and making like three-dimensional images of, of, of tissues. And actually, what uh, the latest uh, te technology within um, uh, the light sheet microscopy is is that you don't have this sheet, you have a laser beam, but it goes very fast back and forth. So it kind of mimics the, 
the, the a light sheet. And here is a movie showing exactly this. So you have a laser that just very fast goes up and down like this. And, and then you scan, you have a CCD camera that, uh, or CMOS camera that collects the image from start to finish when it goes up and down like this. Okay, so that brings me to the, to, to the first paper that I will tell you about today. So the title of this paper is Whole Tissue uh, Biopsy Phenotyping of 3D Tumors Revealed Patterns of Cancer Heterogeneity. And uh, as I told you in the beginning, we, we call this technology DIPCO, and it stands for Diagnosing Immunolabeled Paraffin Embedded Cleared Organs. And it was... Uh, uh, a project made by my postdoc uh, Norbo Yuki here, and also Shigia Ki, that is also coming from KU University, actually, and he still is a, a, a senior researcher now in, in my lab. And uh, this was published in 2017 in, in Nature Biomedical Engineering, and we were very happy that it was also selected to be the front cover of, of uh, that issue of, of the journal. Uh, picture that was taken there, and, and this is what 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 uh, we we can record inside of a of a tumor. In this case, it's the the, the vasculature, and I will tell you about how we did that, and also how we use that information to to determine the tumor stage and and uh, diagnose the tumor. Uh, so this is the basic principle with the method. We, what we used here was something called FFPE tumors, and that stands for formalin fixed paraffin embedded tumors. And this is the very common technology used in, in the clinic today, where when, when you have a patient that goes to the hospital and then you take a biopsy or a piece of tissue that you want to send to the pathologist to, do, to determine the, 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 the stage or diagnose uh, the, the tumor, then it's fixed in, in, in formalin, and then it's, this piece of tissue is then embedded in paraffin for long-term storage. So they have it then in, in, in uh, blocks in the clinic, in the biobanks of hospitals. And what we did here was that we, um, we took these blocks and so this first cartoon here shows a, a mouse, and that, that was used for developing this protocol. But actually, in, in case of the usage in the <coughs> clinic, we, we, we get the tissue like this in, in a block, and, and then we remove the, the paraffin from, from uh, around the, the tissue. And then we, we apply this clearing protocol to the piece of tissue that we have uh, after removing the paraffin, and then we do the staining and everything that we, we, we would like to look at, the immunostaining in our case, for different antibodies of, of interest. And thereafter, we can do, uh, visualize the, the tumor in, in, in light sheet microscopes. And that, uh, th this picture here shows how it looks before clearing this piece of tissue. And then you see here is after the clearing. We used a protocol called iDisco. And then you can clearly see that you can see through the sample in this case, while before the, uh, the clearing, you don't see anything through. And then we use different kind of antibodies that we uh, are interested in, in uh, looking at and, and to, to diagnose this tumor. And we have used several different, and one of them is n cadherine here. And, uh, we can clearly see then uh, uh, the staining in, in the tumor. So in this case, uh, the encadrine is stained with red. And, and what we are in, uh, interested in looking at here is uh, to study the heterogeneity. And that means that uh, we have a, a very heterogeneous expression pattern of, different, of certain proteins. And that is something that is very important to know when, when you stage and diagnose a tumor. Uh, because if it's very heterogeneous, it means that it's usually more aggressive and maybe more difficult to treat than a very homogeneous uh, tumor. And uh, uh, so we, we, at first, we were just happy to see that we could actually do this and to do it also in a tissue volume. Because 
um, for those of you who has worked in, in immune staining, you know that uh, it can be very difficult to, to, to get the antibody to penetrate through the tissue. So we were um, looking at something called EMT in this case. We, uh, I've already t told you about heterogeneity, and this means that at, um, the, the tumor is yeah, very heterogeneous. It has a cells of different kinds, and they are spread out all over the tumor. And, and uh, we wanted to observe this and try to quantify this. And we looked at something called EMT, which stands for epithelial to mesenchymal transition. And also, we also looked at the angiogenesis, which are both these processes play a central r role in, in, in cancer. So here is an image or a movie showing how it could look like. So you see it's a tumor, and it first is stained with this yopro, that is just a nuclear staining. And then uh, e cadherin here, which is a protein that is very important for this EMT process. And you can see that there are certain regions with maybe higher expression. Yeah, here you have pseudo coloring. Uh, then you can see in red, you know, you have a high expression of this E cadherin. And one can clearly see that it's very uh, heterogeneous expression. It's not a homogeneous expression. That is an important information in, in the field of um, when you are diagnosing tumors. And with this uh, 3D imaging, we can do a, a 3D rendering and go into a tumor and, and, and really see you know, different shapes and regions and so on. And uh, EMT, uh, I told you about that, but that is about you know when a cell actually if you have a tumor, a cancer, you want the cell, cells in that tumor to stay there. You don't want them to start to move in the body because then it creates metastasis. And that is, uh, of course, uh, not a good thing. And, and uh, uh, this is described with this process of uh, uh, EMT, epithelial to mesenchymal transition. It, and it means that the cells are actually losing their adherent to, to the tumor, and they start to move freely in the body. And there are certain markers that one can use to, to study these processes. And one, uh, some of them are this e cadherin and that is a protein that kind of keeps the adherent and the attachment to a neighboring cell. And if you are losing that, it means that the cell will start to, 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 to move in the bloodstream. And, uh, you know, it can build up metastasis in, in lungs and other tissues. And, and there are also many other markers of the, this, the, which are described here. But we, so we looked at E. cadherin, N. cadherin, and Bimentin. And then also this CD34 is a, is a protein that is expressed in the walls of, of the blood vessel. So next, we, we wanted to, to look, if, to see if we could actually create the vasculature of, of a tumor in, in three dimensions. Since this is a, a, a feature or characteristics of a tumor that one cannot do with two, 2D imaging, then you just make a slice and you look at the expression, the amount, if it's a lot or less. But actually to create the whole vasculature in three dimensions, then it requires 3D imaging. And here you see that we could actually do, uh, we, we could see blood vessels here depicted in red. And if we do a segmentation and, and select out the blood vessels, we can create this in a computer program uh, and actually see at individual vessels. And here with pseudocolon, we could also measure the diameter of each vessel. And if it's wide, if the, uh, and and we, it's labeled in red, and if it's thin, it's labeled in blue. And this is also a very important feature of, of, of tumors. And this is a cartoon showing how it is in a normal uh, tissue, in a normal vasculature, the, <clears throat> the, the blood vessels are strictly organized, and you know, they are built up in a more uh, orderly fashion, while in, in tumors, it's more chaotic like this, you know, and it has a lot of different shapes and thickness and, 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 and this 
we were interested to see if we can use this information to, to, uh, um, to make a more accurate uh, tool for staging and grading and diagnosing tumors. Um, so here's another movie showing this, this segmentation of, of, a, of, a, of a tumor and, and the vascular tumor. And here again you see CD34, which are the blood vessels in red, and uh, that one can uh, zoom in into the blood system like this, so to the vasculature, and, and you see the, the, this chaotic shape of the blood vessels here, you know, with the blue very thin and red thicker, and it's a lot of, you know, variations also here, and this is also an important feature of, of a tumor that we were interested in to explore if we could uh, use that to quantify and maybe draw some more stronger conclusion for, of the stage and how aggressive this tumor was. So then we did the, this proof of principle so, and, and we used different features of, of trying to, to quantify these blood vessels. So we measured something called vessel tortosity, which uh, is, uh, uh, you know, how, how much it's, it's, it's turning and so on. And, and, then, uh, and then we have also something called kurtosis and another one called skewness. And we put all of this together then trying to, uh, trying to analyze exactly what was going on in this tumor. We also use this ROC anal analysis, which is a way of analyzing uh, uh, um, how accurate a, a system is to, to find uh, true cancers versus false cancers. And we picked a certain problem in, in pathology and in urology, um, and that was a bladder cancer. And, and here is a very critical factor between this T2, T1 and T2 here. These tumors, uh, cis TAT1, are treated in one certain way. And that is uh, while removing with this uh, transurresection. So you move actually the tumors from the bladder. You go in with a tool and take it away. And then after that, you have some kind of immune therapy. And by doing that, you can uh, actually treat these pa patients uh, quite well. But if you have a cancer which is T2 or greater, then it means it's muscle invasive. And the treatment of those patients are very different. Then you have to remove the entire bladder uh, because they, they have a high risk of, of creating this metastasis. So, uh, but sometimes this could be very hard to determine if it's T1 or T2, if it's muscle invasive or not. So we then took a cohort of 39 uh, um, blood pa uh, cancer patients, and then we try to use our this three-dimensional DIPCO method to see if we could actually determine this with higher accuracy than standard two-dimensional immunohistopathology. Uh, and, um, and then we looked at different parameters of this uh, vasculature, and. Uh, the doing so, we found out that the vessel the radius, a combination of the vessel radius and also the, the CD34 density kurtosis could be used to, to, uh, to draw some conclusion about the stage of the tumor. And these graphs here show the different parameters and, and, and this ROC analysis, the higher this curve goes here, the better the method is. And you see the red trace here is the, the, the best combination that we found, which was the vessel radius and CD34. And if you take this into uh, hard numbers, you see that uh, our <coughs> method could determine the, uh, the stage of these bladder tumors with an accuracy of 0 0.84 almost, compared to 0 0.54 when we did it with a two-dimensional method. So this is a significant better method to to, to stage these tumors. We also 
then looked in ovarian cancer, trying to see if we could predict uh, platinum resistance, because that is also in, in for, for this uh, patient group, is very important. If you get ovarian cancer, you would like to take out this, uh, a biopsy sample from the cancer and then determine if it's worthwhile to do a treatment with platinum. If, of course, if it's the, the patient will respond to platinum, then it's a very good uh, treatment. But if that person will not respond to that, then you lose valuable time. You know, it can take months before you determine that this patient is actually not responding to this treatment. So if, if you could do that beforehand, of course, it's a very good thing for this group of patients. Um, so, because then if it, she doesn't respond to that, then you, you, you should remove the ovarian. Um, and uh, we, we looked at the same kind of parameters and the vasculature, and then in this case we, we found that the vessel radius had a very good uh, significance between uh, patients that were actually responders and patients that, di that did not respond. So we could uh, and here are two quite good pictures showing this, that here you have an ovarian cancer norma from a 52-year-old female, which is a high grade, and, uh, and uh, uh, that is, is not responding to the treatment. And you see, compared to a, pa a sample from a patient that is responding, and then you see that it's more bluish here. So you have thinner uh, vessels, and they are not so so uh, heterogeneous. It's not varying that much, you know. But while comparing in this tumor, where you have red and yellow and green and blue and all the colors are there, while here it's more homogeneous, and that patient is also responding to that treatment. And here is just a zoom in picture showing this more in detail, and that was also depicted in this front cover picture where we could see the differences there. Another paper that also came from this project, we, we looked at the lymph uh, vasculature. And uh, uh, there we could also, because actually less is known about the lymphatic microvasculature, but using an antibody called for Forlive-1, we could al also hear uh, uh, stage this tumor with uh, good uh, accuracy when looking at the <coughs> density kurtosis in this case of the vasculature. Um, next, we wanted to see if we could look at single cells in these tumors. So, so, so we used this technology that we developed and we kind of cranked up the resolution and really took high resolution images because we were interested to see if we can determine and, and single out each uh, single cell in this tumor. And that was actually uh, possible. And you see here, we count that the number of cells in this tumor was 13,240,289 cells. And of course, with that information, we had like a coordinate, the spatial coordinate of each cell in the tumor. And we could then do, use uh, multiplexed uh, imaging and, and, and coup staining of, of different proteins and go in and look at the expression of one single um, protein in one single, or not one single protein, but in one single cell, the protein expression in that single cell. Um, so here you see a video where we looked at vimentin in, uh, in a tumor, and uh, in a bladder tumor. And we used these coordinates, and then we, we used sebda coloring, and then you could see each this sphere here represent one cell, and if it's red, it means that it has a high vimentin intensity or expression compared to bluish cells, which are, has a lower expression. And you see that very clearly here that th there are very heterogeneous expression pattern with certain regions showing up in red and others in blue and, 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 and so on and so forth. And a lot of information can be extracted from here. You know, in this case, we looked at Vimentin, but of course we can use any antibody available and, and look at the expression on the single cell level in, in, in the tumor. Another issue that came up during the course of this project was that uh, um, these tissue samples are, are quite valuable for the pathologist. They, they don't want to 
you know, us to, to destroy the samples. So, so then we tried if, uh, to see if we could like re-embed the sample after the experiment. So what we did was that we, 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 we uh, removed the paraffin, we did the clearing, we did your immunostaining, and then we visualized the whole uh, tissue block. And after that, we, we kind of make it, made it intransparent again, and also embedded it in, in, in paraffin. So, so we could kind of return it back to the, to the pathologist, and they could store it again in the, in the biobank. And that was actually uh, possible to do. And we tried with many different uh, antibodies, looking, you see here, before uh, DIPCO and after, and uh, for, for different antigens. And you see that uh, it, they look quite similar before and after. So that was actually possible. And we evaluated with many different markers and, and uh, uh, yeah, so that uh, we, the, we, we, we could, you know, return it back to the biobank after the examination. Okay, so now I will uh, jump into the next project that is kind of an extension of this first project. And we have chosen to, to label this one DIFCO. And it stands for Diagnosing Immunolabeled in situ Hybridization Fixed Cleared or Organs. And in this case, you see that we use this term multimodal. And multimodal means that it's two different technologies that are combined. In our case here, you see also that we talk about RNA and protein signatures. And that means that we use two different uh, technologies to, to, to um, stain both uh, RNAs and proteins in, in this. And that was also, this is a project that was also uh, done by Nobel Jurki and Shigi Aiki and also Dagmara is a co-author here. And I think she, she was here also at KU working a little bit in Volcano's lab. Um, but this is unpublished. I will not uh, reveal too much about the, 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 the protocol as such. I will tell you a little bit about you know, uh, the basic idea that we had when we, we made this uh, project. And, and um, you know, the human genome, um, it was um, uh, uh, determined like, I think it was in 2000 or 2001 or something like that. And, we, then we saw that they saw that we had three billion DNA base pairs, actually. And an interesting detail that came up from that was that, you know, uh, it was known that the human genome include both protein coding DNA genes and also non coding. And, and only 1.5% of the, the whole human genome constitutes of, of sequences that are. In, in, in protein coding genes. So there are like 85% of the human genome that are actually coding for non-coding uh, DNAs. And, and, and um, that is something that is very interesting. It means that with these technologies that we have today, we can look at so many more things um, besides then using antibodies, which of course, stains for, for proteins. But the, they only then uh, um, uh, covers 1.5% of the whole human genome, one could say. So th there are like 98.5% uh, of, of human genome that we, is not actually studied at all in pathology, or very, very little at least. And um, uh, there are like uh, these non-coding RNAs and DNAs include uh, tRNA, ribosomal RNA, microRNA, SN RNA, and 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 one thing that we, one of these that we were quite interested in is these long non-coding RNAs, and about sixty thousand exist with the human genome about this, and recently. Uh, these long non-coding RNAs are emerging as a new player in tumor ge genesis, actually. And this is a very brief cartoon showing a little bit of, of uh, what happens from DNA to, to a protein. And you have the, 
the, the DNA here, and then you have transcription and creates the RNA, and then you have translation and then creates the, the, the protein. But then, uh, as I told you, there are a lot of these non-coding RNAs, and they are involved here, and, and also in these proteins with the chromatin modification and so on. And, and, and they're also involved in splicing and, and, and uh, mRNA stability, and a lot of interesting things actually happens here for these non-coding RNAs. And we aimed in this project to look a little bit at the these long non-coding RNAs. And um, there are also another uh, benefit of using, um, of, of looking at RNA compared to, to antibodies. As all of you know, um, when you do immunolabeling, it mu very much comes down to what kind of antibody you use. Some antibodies are very good and they work nicely, but some are very bad or it's very difficult to, to do uh, some certain staining. And this is even a more critical issue when you're working with, with tissue volumes where maybe the b largest volume that we worked with was like up to five, six millimeters or so in a cubic, in a cube like that. And, and then to get the antibody to penetrate through that tissue, that could be very difficult. And not all antibodies work at all. So then we, we cannot study some certain proteins because of these technical issues that exist. So, but if we could um, use, uh, look at RNA instead and do in situ hybridization, that is less of an issue for the, when it comes to penetration uh, because these are smaller than the antibodies and they is more easily penetrate through the tissue. And it's also very much easier also to, to uh, uh, to uh, design and, and uh, create these um, RNA probes compared to antibodies, which is, takes longer time and more difficult and more expensive, so on. And, and then also, as I mentioned, these are potentially new cancer hallmarks that is like a, a big palette or arena there of, 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 of new targets that has not been studied. Um, uh, but, uh, of course, the, 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 there are also some, some obstacles that need to, to be overcome in order to do this. And one is that, especially when it comes to the clinic, because <clears throat> since the, the tissues are, are, are handled in a certain way in the clinic that is maybe not optimal for doing uh, in situ hybridization, you cannot, uh, it, it's difficult when you do the, the, these fixation procedures and and it's at least not optimal for doing in situ hybridization. And it's also when studying RNAs, you cannot study everything. Like we, we couldn't do this segmentation for blood vessels, the, for instance, when looking at the uh, RNA expression. So and study structures could be a little bit difficult with this. But this is still something that we are exploring. So I will jump right into here and give you some proofs of principle with, with this protocol, the new protocol that we have developed. And so here you see in situ hybridization of clinical tumor samples that uh, we also here were interested in looking at intratumor heterogeneity. And in this case for a melanoma here, one can see this uh, expression of this CD274. And, and, and here you see very clear regions where you have high expression and low expression. And it's also a very heterogeneous expression pattern of, of, of this one. And, and compare here to, to a region with very low, which is maybe normal tissue or outside the tumor. Uh, and this CD274, it comes uh, in codes for the program death ligand 1. Uh, which was partially developed as a Nobel Prize this year, right, by Hongo, yeah, Hongo, uh, Hongo. Um, and then um, in this case here, we looked at renal pelvic cancer, and, and in this case, we looked for this UCA1, and that is a long non-coding RNA, which is involved in the process of cancer cells acquiring metastatic potential. And also here, we could see uh, you know, the regions where this expression of this um, uh, 
uh, marker was was fairly high you know, <coughs> in different regions here, and that is. Uh, very int interesting information that can be used by pathologists to, uh, to determine uh, what, uh, the, the, the treatment that this patient will, will have. Uh, here's another uh, example of uh, where we use this multimodal imaging. So now we are actually doing both in situ hybridization, looking for PROM1, and immunolabeling looking for CD34. And if you remember from the previous project, CD34 is a protein that uh, is expressed in the walls of blood vessels. So by this information, we could combine the, the vessel structure with RNA expression in certain cells. And this PROM1, it comes for, for the cancer stem cell market, CD133, I think many of you heard about. And that is interesting in many types of cancer, and it has been suggested that, you know, in prostate cancer and other cancer types that this marker could be very important to, uh, to target. And here is a typical example when, when uh, the, the antibodies, existing antibodies are not that good, you know. So it's very hard to, to study CD133 actually in, in a proper way. But uh, by using, looking at the RNA from one here, it's... Um, it's a new way of uh, attacking this problem and, and extracting information. And what was very interesting to see here, you see here's a, a breast cancer tumor and, and you see we, we selected two different regions and zoomed in here and did this vessel segmentation. And, and then one could see that certain areas, you know, where it's showing up here, there, there seems to be some cells that has high expression of this PROM1 and also in these areas here. And this is interesting information about that can be uh, potential new, new markers of, of, uh, 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 that can be used to determine the stage and, and how aggressive the tumors are. And here again, we did this 3D rendering in a movie with the, the, the vasculature in white, and then we have different cells here using pseudo coloring uh, the, uh, and here we did a calculation of how far from the blood vessel these prone cells was. And you see it blue, then it means that it's uh, uh, further away, and red, then the, it's uh, nearer, and uh, staining for this prone one. And we could, you know, extract this information from the entire tumor. Here we have selected uh, some of these. Uh, otherwise, it was too blurry to have if we would do it for all the cells, but the, the, these are some of them. And uh, we could also quantify b with this single cell analysis that I showed you before, and, and then we could actually count or measure the, the distance from the blood vessel to this cell, to, to, the, uh, to, to each cell, and then w with regards to... Uh, to uh, uh, staining here. In this case, it's MALAT1, which is also a non, long non-coding RNA that to, uh, contributes to tumor progression and cell stemness. And interestingly, what we saw here was that ma these cells that have high expression of this marker MALAT1, they were actually closer to the blood vessels compared to the cells that were negative for this one. That is also interesting information that at this stage, we, we don't know maybe uh, um, what, what, how it can be used clinically, but it's a potential new way of, of, of quantifying uh, uh, tumors. Uh, here's another example where we did, again, multimodal imaging, looking at uh, all LGR5, uh, which is uh, overexpression of this LGR5 correlates with poor survival of colon cancer. And um, again, we could do multimodal imaging looking for the RNA and CD34, the, the blood vessel marker. And we saw, you know, these uh, uh, interesting regions where we have this high expression showing up here and there in this, uh, in this tumor. So the last part of this project um, was um, we, we wanted to, to see if this technology could be used in, in, in organoids. 
And this is an interesting new field uh, where, uh, that we think has great potential also for precision medicine. And uh, just to give you a brief background about the organo, it's, uh, it's self-organized three-dimensional tissue cultures that are derived from stem cells. And uh, the sizes are typically spanning between 100 micrometer to 5 millimeter. And interestingly, if you look at uh, tumor or cancer uh, organoids, they, they conserve and preserve the molecular and cellular heterogeneity of the original tumor. So you can take cells and create a, an entire tumor. And if you look at that uh, organoid compared to the original tissue, it has many similarities. And that is very interesting for, to be used in the clinic because then one can imagine that you take a, a, a cell from a tumor, you create an organoid, and then you can treat this organoid before you start the treatment on the patient. And then you can s design maybe personal medicine which is best for treating this type of tumor before you actually expose the patient to this treatment. And then when you have kind of optimized that treatment, you move into the real patient. So that is an in interesting new field in, in, in oncology. Um, and uh, uh, this um, we, we tried here. In this case, when we set up the pro uh, project or the protocol, we, we used uh, human forebrained or organoids uh, from a collaborator. And, and uh, we, we tried our method, uh, looking here at, at Nestin, Ness, and then DCX also. And uh, we were interested to see if this technology also could be applied on organoids, since these are also three-dimensional structures that you, you don't want to slice them, and it's very difficult to do. They are you know, small and, and, and difficult to handle. So we saw many benefits of using this technology for uh, uh, organoids. And to kind of uh, tie back to this uh, approach that we have to look into cancers, we, we use human colon rectal cancer organoids. And then we looked at the LGR5 and, uh, uh, and, and we could then see that uh, uh, we, we were actually abling, able to, to, to stain for a lot of these uh, different markers also in organoids, which kind of proved prove the, the strength of this uh, difficult protocol. So this brings me to, to the summary slide here. So today I've told you about that we have developed a method uh, where we can do volumetric imaging of intact clinical tumor samples. And uh, with that we could visualize and quantify intratumor heterogeneity. In, in clinical specimens from <coughs> patients. And uh, <coughs> we could, uh, with this method, we had improved diagnosis and staging uh, by using volumetric imaging compared to a two-dimensional imaging. And we, we, I also showed you that uh, we could do re-embedding after the experiment with uh, uh, this technology. So we didn't actually destroy the samples. And last, uh, here I showed you that we, we could, were also able to, to do multimodal volumetric imaging of whole tumors. And also I showed you that this offers new opportunities to diagnose and treat patients with cancer, with the new, uh, new markers. And the last slide here is uh, all the people working with this and collaborators and so on. And uh, especially I would like to uh, uh, acknowledge Nobuyuki Tanaka, who, who, who really ran all of these projects, analysis, and all the experiments, and designed much of the project, and so on. And also Shigeaki Kanatani, who, who was working with light sheet microscopy and did all this uh, um, image processing, and so on. And then, of course, all, all the other uh, collaborators that have he helped a lot with this project, and also our foundations that uh, supported this work. I would like to thank. Thank you for your attention. Thank you very much, Carl. Uh, so, uh, any questions from the audience?
No? Uh, so uh, I have a kind of practical question. Uh, yeah. So when you analyze and examine the patient biopsy sample by right state microscope, uh, how long does it take to return the report? Yeah, so, so no, that depends a little bit on of, of how big the sample is. And also when we set up the microscope or the light sheet microscope to do this, uh, we can select the resolution that we would like to have. So if we, would, if we want to have higher resolution, then it takes longer time. With lower resolution, it takes less time. But we can do it in, 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 in a number of days. So the, the, the clearing and so on take a couple of days, and then maybe running the sample take a, a day, and then afterwards to do the analysis and so on. But uh, it's a number of days. Mm -hmm. You can say within a week. Yeah, yeah, within right. a week. Mm -hmm. Yeah, And that is, of course, important because uh, if I showed you, if you remember this table I showed you with the different clearing protocols, if, if, if such a technology will be used in the clinic, time is of essence because, uh, of course, you cannot have, wait one month for, you know, diagnosing a tumor. Then maybe this patient will almost die, you know. You, you have to do this within a couple of days for, for it to be applied clinically. Thank you. Any questions? I uh, just had a curiosity. Um, for your, oh, the first technique that you showed, the DIPCO, yeah. with the whole brain IHC staining or immunofluorescent staining, um, does he, are you only able to do one marker per sample, or can you do multiple markers with the same sample? We can do multiple markers. We can do up to, uh, to I think uh, the, the system allows five markers. Yeah. So it depends on you know how well we can separate with the with the with the lasers and so on, but uh, up to five I can say. And there are I can say that with the with the there are some interesting opportunities when they come to this in situ labeling when we did RNA. But when you say five there, we are talking about immunolabeling with antibodies. But if you do RNA in C2 hybridization, there are now new possibilities that we are we are exploring to to uh, remove the the staining, and then we can restain, you know. So so we can kind of cycle and do it again and again and again, and 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 that could maybe you know be a possibility. Yeah, exactly. Uh, yeah, exactly. So so th there are you know ways to maybe overcome that this uh, limit of, of five. Yeah, it's simultaneously. Then we are talking like parallel. Yeah, yeah. So, so, so we can uh, stain five simultaneously and then run them in the system. Mm. Anything else? Any questions? Uh, it sounds or uh, uh, difficult to uh, evaluate or quantify the quality of a tumor. Uh, so, uh, is there any parameter uh, uh, to uh, evaluate the quality of a tumor uh, you will be interested in or you will try? So, I mean, at this stage, what we have worked now has been more of kind of developing this protocol to, to, do, to be able to do this. You know. One could say, Maybe the next step would be to try different markers. Uh, uh, if you remember here, we, we showed you some e cadherin and n cadherin, vimentin, and also blood vessels. But of course, we can use any antibody out there if it uh, allows us to you know, penetrate the tissue and everything. So I think that uh, there are great possibilities to, to find new, new markers, but in, in our case, our work has mainly been to, to uh, developing the protocol and method to do this. The next step for us or others is to kind of use this, because it's quite easy to use it. If you have a light sheet microscope, uh, then you can easily apply this protocol and then yeah, explore uh, new, new markers and new antibodies and RNAs. Thanks. Thank you. Uh, any other question? Yes. 
So the、um, the tissue imaging、mm -hmm. with、uh, the whole tissue inside chemistry looks、uh, very beautiful. But also you said、um, it depends on the antibody.、Um, so practically speaking, how different? What determines the penetration depth of the antibody, or is that determined partly by the antigen instead? I I think that、uh, you know. That is maybe a little bit difficult to say. It, it, it's how well, you know. It, it's more ab about I think trial and error, you know. And you know some antibodies works very well and some not. And that could depend on, on you know the antigen as such and and you know how well if it interacts with other epitopes or something while traveling to its target. And、uh, we also use conjugated antibodies because.、Uh, There is a problem, of course, if you have a secondary antibody. Also, you know that then you have to have penetration for that, then unspecific signals, and yeah. So, so I think that、um, yeah, it's it's difficult to answer exactly what what, what is the cause of of, of this problem. But、um, some antibodies are good, and some some are bad. And you know,、uh, probably you know also that. Uh, even though you look at the same, you know, protein, different batches can tell them、uh, could even be, you know, better or worse. And this is, of course, the case here, even even more for, for us with these volumetric images.、Mm. And I know that、um, I'm thinking of a paper by Miyawaki, you know, at Sushi Miyawaki at Riken. He developed this scale method, I think, and and in his paper he has a long. Table of different antibodies and penetration depth, and they have really tried to, you know, quantify、uh, the penetration there. And it's、uh, th therefore, of course, our other project there、uh, named D DIFCO is so interesting because that is not、uh, a problem for doing in situ hybridization. Of course, we have other problems there, but the penetration is easier.、Yeah. So.、Uh, If the antibody works very well in the classical immunocyte chemistry, with using the thick specimen, yeah,、uh, that、uh, indicate this antibody also works for the right microbe. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah I think so. Yeah, should be no problem. And I th I see this maybe a little bit like if you think about this technology. It will not replace like standard pathology or standard you know immuno. Uh, histopathology, but I think it could be a, a great complement to uh, to uh, the common techniques used today, and, and maybe in some certain cases、uh, it could be interesting to turn into 3D. It's the same, you know, if you think about regular imaging in the clinic. If you come in and have a broken leg, you don't usually use MRI to、uh, to, to 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 observe that with. Uh, in a patient, but if you have maybe a problem with the shoulder, that then maybe it requires three-dimensional imaging, a, a higher resolution, better method to to find the cause of a problem. And I think that、uh, in the future,、uh, and and I think all of you agree about about that is that you know if we can do three-dimensional imaging, it's just a matter of time when it will be applied in the clinic. Yeah, and 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 if it takes five year or ten year or fifty year, I don't know. But eventually, we will be able to do three dimensional imaging in the clinic, and 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 it will be better than two D because it's a three dimensional、uh, object that we are observing. So, of course, one should use three three D. Anything else? Yes.、Uh, thank you for nice talk.、Uh, I'm an electron microscope、uh, specialist, as you know. Yeah. And、uh, I was wondering, your、uh, wonderful technique is adaptable for the、uh, electron microscope、uh, observation.、Uh, usually, FFP sample is not adaptable for the electron microscope ob observation. But、uh, yeah, uh, we are now trying to、uh, develop a 3D analysis for the electron microscope and also the. <laughs> Uh, Immunostain sample、uh, analysis with electron microscope、uh, is、uh, usually carried out in our laboratory. So, 
uh, if that is uh, adaptable for the electron microscope analysis, well, uh, that is really the wonderful application, I guess. Yeah, no, of course, um, EM, but I, I think the field of EM has kind of taken, taken a, a different path where you kind of remove thin slices, right? You, you, you take a, a picture and then you remove maybe a couple of nanometers and then you take another picture and then remove and then you reconstruct it afterwards in the uh, with some fancy uh, imaging software. Um, uh, and I think it will be difficult for the electrons to penetrate the tissue in a similar way that we are doing with light sheet, but uh, I'm not sure. And the clearing is not required in, in light, uh, in, 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 in EM, right? Or? Uh, I guess if that is adapted adapt for the electron microscope, primary carried out that analysis and then transferred to electron microscope observation, I, I guess. Yeah. This is the sequential analysis, maybe the one case. Yeah, if one could do that with an EM resolution, it would be a great tool, of course, yeah. Hmm. Yeah. So, uh, almost to four o'clock. Uh, I, I can take one more question if you have. No. Okay, uh, thank you very much, Per. Mm -hmm. And uh, uh, probably you can come back next year again. Oh, of course. Right? <laughs> okay, thank you. Thank you. Thank you, thank you for your attention.